Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Michael Noland here and tonight we're going to be talking about Deep Purple. Not only Deep Purple, but we're going to ask the question, which Deep Purple was the real Deep Purple? Now for the very few of you who aren't aware of Deep Purple's history, this is the one band in rock and roll that was famous for, well, their many incarnations. So much so, they were divided by marks. There was Deep Purple Mark I, Deep Purple Mark II, Deep Purple Mark III, all the way up to, well, let's see, where are we now? Deep Purple Mark 99? I'm not sure. Sadly, since the passing of their keyboardist, John Lord, my favorite keyboardist, rock keyboardist of all time, I've lost interest in the band currently. But back in the day, what a band. This was the one band that could put out an album that would turn my head away from Led Zeppelin, even more so than Black Sabbath. And the reason for that was because of their magnificent guitar player, Ricky Blackmore. Now I'm gonna be redoing my top 10 guitar players of all times list. Now there won't be anybody being taken off that top list, but I am going to rearrange it. You know, when I did that list, I did that from my lifetime of memories of my favorite guitarists. And when I first put this channel together, that's what I honestly believed. But in the past year, folks, I've been listening to these guys, and you know what? A couple of them need to be readjusted slightly upwards, and Richie Blackmore is one of those guitarists. This is the one guitarist that interested me on their albums, listening to where he was going with his leads and such, as much as I listened to the mighty Jimmy Page. You add him with the fact that John Lord was on keyboards and was every bit on keyboards, the virtuoso that Richie Blackmore ever was, and you have one hell of a powerful rock band. Now Deep Purple was another one of those bands that was really big in the 70s, but had their roots really in the 60s, the late 60s, but the 60s. And uh, they were formed in 1968, but it was in 1967 that the band's roots were really starting to develop. That's when John Lord met Chris Curtis and Chris had an idea for a band. He wanted to call it Roundabout. Now when Deep Purple members talk about this name as it being kind of a silly name they almost chose, I don't agree with them. I think this would have been the perfect name for this band. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not second guessing Deep Purple being a fantastic name, but think about it. Chris Curtis had this idea. He wanted the band to be whoever was currently in it. Does that sound like anybody? Yeah. Deep Purple. All right, so as you know, a roundabout is a circular type of roadway where cars entering can choose where to exit. And this band, Chris thought, could be just like that. If a band member got burnt out, he could leave the band. They would find somebody to replace him, and so on and so on. And I've talked about this in the past. I'm a lot more forgiving of bands playing with very few of the members I want in front of me when something like this exists at the very beginning of the band. Now these guys didn't have any idea at this time that this whole idea, the name Roundabout, would eventually uh, determine exactly what kind of band they would be. But in 1967, Chris and John Lord were still hoping to encourage Richie Blackmore, a great guitarist who had been trained from a very young age and was a virtuoso. They knew this guy had to be in the band. Now, by the time 1968 rolled around, Richie Blackmore was available and they asked uh, Nick Semper to join the band on bass and the beginnings of the band was starting to happen. The issue over what to name the band again raised its ugly head and many names were proposed. Concrete God, Utopian Future, and even Bad Habits were all suggested. But Richie Blackmore had an idea. You see, his grandmother loved this old song. And she had asked him if this new band of his was going to uh, play her favorite song. And of course, the name of that song was Deep Purple. This wouldn't be the last time that Richie Blackmore would look into his past 
for inspiration. It was at this point they brought in Ron Evans, and Ron Evans wasn't happy with their drummer. He had suggested he knew this kid, right? Ian Pace, and he said he was a far better drummer. And so when their drummer went out for a pack of cigarettes at a local pub, they auditioned Ian Pace. Now, later on, Ian Pace would say he didn't care who got hurt, he wanted in that band. He felt something special was happening here and he definitely wanted to be a part of it. The band auditioned him and wisely chose Ian Pace as their drummer, one of the finest rock drummers in rock history, as far as I'm concerned. They then went on to record their first album. They had a kind of big hit with the song Hush, and uh, you know what? Most people would have been happy with that sound. That was a great sound. Deep Purple had a groove, and yet members weren't exactly happy in the direction this band was going. Now, Rod Evans evidently had a girlfriend around this time, and he was was becoming very, well, the band members described him as becoming very Hollywood, with aspirations of even becoming an actor. Richie Blackmore was on the lookout for a kick-ass vocalist. When Mick Underwood from the band episode six suggested an Ian Gillen, Richie had found his vocalist, even grabbing their bass player, Roger Glover in the arrangement. Now their original bass player has said many times that he has felt so stabbed in the back at this whole deal. Replacing a member with one foot out the door was one thing, but he wanted to still be a part of this. John Lord years later said that this was the most cowardly thing the band had ever done. But in the end, the second version of Deep Purple, Mark II, arrived. Now at first there was a real junior status to Ian and Roger, uh, especially amongst Deep Purple's management. Now you have to remember Deep Purple had asked their management to do the dirty work firing the two members that these two were replacing. And that management, by the way, when asked by these two new members for basically what they were asking for was wardrobe money, they were given that money, but they were told, especially Ian, never ask that again or they'd be out of the band quicker than they had arrived. Now at this point, the band's trying to find their feet. They recorded an album with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and uh, that was largely a John Lord composition with Ian Gillen supplying the lyrics to these songs written the night before the performance. John Lord remembers that he had a very haphazard attitude about writing the lyrics, and Ian remembers not feeling very secure in the band. Now, while all of this is going on, Richie Blackmore is not happy. He wanted to be in a rock band, he didn't want to play with orchestras, and he suggested that to the band. He said, let's just make one great rock record. If that doesn't work out, then I'll play with orchestras if I have to. Now it's interesting, during these recordings, Richie Blackmore reached into his past once again, stealing essentially a riff from an old Ricky Nelson song of all artists. This is that dun 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 right? That lick. Now adding a few more chords to that riff, restructuring the whole thing, they came up with a magnificent song, Black Knight. The resulting album, of course, Deep Purple in Rock. Mark II had arrived. Now I gotta tell you everything that in rock promised Machine Head delivered. John Lord would later say that during this period that he was just absolutely amazed at the ability of Richie Blackmore to just come up with catchy guitar riffs. Blackmore thoroughly involved in writing and how the sound would go down with John Lord's keyboards complimenting everything he does. This album blew my socks off when I first heard it. You know, I couldn't believe it. This album was every bit as strong as Led Zeppelin IV, stronger than most of the efforts of all the hottest bands out there, an anthem of a song that I got tired of very quickly. And of course, I'm talking about Smoke on the Water. I've said in the past, 
uh, that's my least favorite song on this album, and yet it's still a great track. And I've also said that I've never tired of this album, but this was also the album and the touring around this album where uh, egos came to blow. If Ian Gillen thought something was black, Richie Blackmore thought it was white. These two just couldn't seem to get along. Now, you know, it's interesting. I've thought about this before because, uh, you know, uh, Ian Gillen has always been kind of a gregarious kind of guy, very friendly, very easy to listen to in his interviews, fairly well-spoken, a real Paul McCartney kind of guy. And Richie Blackmore is the more touchy-feely kind of, almost, John Lennon kind of guy. And yet Paul McCartney and John Lennon somehow made it work. Yeah, and you know what? I've just got to wonder why Blackmore and Gillen couldn't make it work. And the only thing that I can come up with is their damned egos. Now, George Harrison has stated many times that the Beatles had egos. Don't worry about that. But somehow they always managed to keep those egos in check. And here in Deep Purple, and you gotta understand, this is the 70s, not the 60s. Things had become a lot more professional. The live gear and PAs they were playing with uh, were absolutely impossible five years prior to when this band was in its true heyday. They were playing outdoor concerts that could not have ever been put together five years prior to this band. Either way, the long of the short of it, uh, Blackmore exits Deep Purple at this point. Now back to this time period with Deep Purple. Richie Blackmore was very instrumental in firing Roger Glover. Uh, more on that in a minute. And uh, before long, he was gone out of the band. And of course, the band hired David Coverdale eventually, as well as Glenn Hughes. And we got the magnificent album Album, folks I love this album and at the time of this album and of course I'm talking about Deep Purple's burn album I was happy with the change so there was this big transition happening once again with Deep Purple uh, starting with the album uh, of Machine Head and by the time burn was done we have a different Deep Purple, don't we? At this point, we have David Coverdale on vocals and Glenn Hughes on bass. Glenn Hughes also being a vocalist, uh, although his style was a lot more bluesed bass. Uh, some of the band members complaining that he was sounding more and more like Stevie Wonder every day. Now, I like this incarnation of the band as well. I love the albums Stormbringer and Come Taste the Band. And as I've stated before, if they had stayed with this incarnation, I think this incarnation, although not quite on the level of Mark II, would have been very, very successful. But that was not to happen. Certainly with the death of Tommy Bolin, that uh, lineup was never going to get back together. And of course, at this time, we're starting to see Deep Purple fracture. Now it's after this time period that basically we get Deep Purple in three different bands, don't we? We have David Coverdale and a reluctant John Lord in Whitesnake. Ian Gillen had formed his own band, the Ian Gillen Band, and they had done quite well. Finances and egos kind of destroyed that band. And of course, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, who also included Roger Glover, the same guy that Richie had fired from Deep Purple earlier. Now, the five members of Mark II would get back together again. They would put out further albums, and in my opinion, this is Deep Purple. Anything else isn't quite as deep a purple as I would like, especially with recent incarnations and guitarists that play a completely different style than what I identify as uh, Deep Purple. I've lost interest in the band as it has existed in the last 20 years. But something happens when Richie Blackmore, John Lord, Roger Glover, Ian Pace, and Ian Gilmore get together and it's something they should have guarded very closely and kept themselves tightly to each other's vest. Because I'm gonna tell you, this is the one band that with a little more stability could have actually challenged Led Zeppelin 
in the 70s. Now granted, they needed all five members, especially with Led Zeppelin uh, having a, a built-in keyboard player like John Paul Jones and bass player. They needed a fifth member. And I'll tell you, John Lord is everything that John Paul Jones is on keyboards and more. When you listen to this band, you almost feel like this is what rock and roll would have been if it had arrived in the 1800s. There's a classical bent to this band that no other band has ever quite been able to grab a hold of. And most of that has to do with Richie Blackmore and John Lord's riffing. With a lead vocalist who could yelp like Robert Plant, not quite the lead vocalist Robert Plant was, but still one of rock's top echelon vocalists, a great bass player, and one of rock's greatest drummers, this band couldn't lose. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed tonight's video. If you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up. That helps the YouTube algorithm better identify the channel and the channel grows. If you haven't uh, subscribed to the channel as of yet, it is so easy. All you have to do is hit that subscribe to the tribe button, then hit that top bell icon and you'll be notified of all my future videos dealing with uh, rock and roll's greatest artists from classic rock all the way up into the fiascos that are happening in the modern uh, music industry today. All right, guys, I'm about ready to film my next video, and until I can get that uploaded, why not watch one of these? I'm Michael Nolan, this is The Bottom Line, and guys, we are the tribe, and I'll see you in my next video.